Good morning. I woke this morning to cloudy skies and I presume drizzle. And immediately the words of Psalm 147 came to mind. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. But somehow, you all have banished the rain away somehow. So it is an extra joy to welcome you all here to worship, whether you're a member or a visitor. Uh, thank you, all of you, wearing your name tags. That helps those who are a little bit shy for fear of forgetting a name to, uh, to talk, to chat, to mingle. And thank you for those on the inside chairs that have already found those blue friendship pads and sent them down the way. That's extremely helpful to the office. Uh, if you have just joined us, you missed our 10 o'clock class that I hope you'll join uh, us with next Sunday. Sundays at 10, we always have excellent classes, information's in your bulletin. And those classes take place on the far end of the deck. Uh, next week, Isa, are you teaching next week? Yeah, I thought so. And I'm going to ask you if you'd come up and give a little announcement from the back of the bulletin. This way, we, we have double duty here. Folks can see who's going to be teaching. And you also can let them know about something coming next year. Isa, come on up. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Pastor Kathy, for your encouragement and support. Um, my name is Isa Saliba, um, and my wife, Eleanor, here. Uh, we, um, uh, last, a couple of years ago, led a group of, uh, from the chapel here on a visit to the Holy Land, uh, to Israel, and we're going to do that again uh, in May of uh, next year. And if you are able, we would love to have you join us. <clears throat> uh, the places are limited. We're going to limit the group to about 20 people. But we would love to have you join us. And uh, as a uh, pastor, <clears throat> a retired pastor over the years, I led uh, many groups uh, to, uh, to the Holy Land where I was born and raised. And then in recent years, uh, Alan and I have done this together. And the purpose of our visit is really more uh, educational and also faith building. We want to encourage you in your faith and commitment to Christ. And you see the land where uh, things uh, in the ministry of our Lord have has happened. Now, there will be brochures available in the back uh, at the welcome desk. And we will stand there in case you have uh, any questions. And then on uh, uh, the 24th of March, we will have an information meeting where we can uh, discuss the journey, go through the itinerary, and the places we will be visiting, and answering any questions as well. I'd just like to uh, give a few comments of some people from the chapel after our journey uh, the last time. <clears throat> Some of the comments, uh, the Bible was black and white. After our visit, it became vivid color. Uh, another comment, this was indeed the trip of a lifetime. Another comment, thank you for guiding us geographically and spiritually. <laughs> another one was wonderful, sometimes overwhelming experience. Another one. What a spectacular and meaningful journey and pilgrimage we have experienced. So we ask you to consider, if you've never been to Israel in your life, uh, it is really uh, one that uh, every Christian should do at least once in a lifetime to visit the places where our Lord ministered, where he was born, where he died and ascended to heaven. And we are here to uh, organize that trip uh, May uh, of uh, 2019. If you have any questions at the end of the service, like I said, we'll be on the deck. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isa. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, I hope to see all of you back here with a few condo buddies on your arm. 
uh, for our Sarasota Early Music Consort concert. And when they're here, I'm going to ask them what that word consort means. Do you know? You probably do, Cynthia. It just means group. And it's like a group. It's like a concert. Oh. Concert group. sounds much more elegant. Do you have anything concert. you wanted to add to that? Um, these are, are people that come from all over. They come from all over the country because they're snowbirds, as a lot of people here are. And they also come from Canada, a couple of Canadian ones. So they, they join together and they play music that is not usually heard. So if you would be interested in, in seeing their interesting costumes and seeing all these interesting instruments, which are, they, they have these recorders that are the size of organ pipe. So some of these organ pipes are quite large up here. And so you should see what that looks like when they play the instrument. Um, anyway, I think you would really enjoy it. So come and join us this afternoon at four. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, the School of Christian Living is this Wednesday as Dr. Luter Whitlock continues his series on, uh, based on his book, Divided We Fall, A History of the Disunity of the Church. And very important, there is a new table out on the deck, has a lace tablecloth. Sign up for the chapel's very first Passover Seder observation a full seder meal included all of the smells all of the foods all of the symbols the scriptures the prayers that our jewish friends have been enjoying for the past three thousand years and you'll find more details in the bulletin but god is good and when we come together it's with the knowledge that the god who created us with such love is here with us Let's take a moment to stand to welcome one another in Christ. <clears throat> Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before God with joyful songs. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God, your faithfulness is new every morning and truly startles us with your goodness and grace. In the quiet of this hour, we seek to give back to you that which you deserve, our love, our devotion, our worship. And so move freely among us, speaking to each the words we need to hear. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
it seems emotionally a little odd to move from this chant of rejoicing into the need that we have for forgiveness. But we do. We are, have the offering, of course, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that when we confess our sin, he's faithful, he just, he forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's part of what we rejoice about. Let's join together in our prayer of confession. Almighty God, your mercies are new every morning. Your faithfulness never ends. You bless us in so many ways with your goodness and love. Forgive us when our faith falters and we act like lost, frightened children. Forgive us when we forget that the days of our lives are in your hands or fail to share your loving kindness with others. By the power of your Holy Spirit, free us from every fear and distraction. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear and believe the good news. By grace we have been saved through faith. This is not our own doing, it is the gift of God, not because of works, so that no one may boast. This is the gift of God, not of works, so In the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks Amen. Be. Thank you, Julian. And I wish you all could sit up here and take a turn listening to how amazing you sound when you sing. <laughs> it truly is a treat. Well, this is an extra special Sunday. On behalf of the session, I am pleased to introduce to you James and Mercy Kendry and their daughter, Nira Alicia Kendry, who comes before us to receive the sacrament of baptism. Pat, how about if you stand here? And Nira, come on over here. You're not shy. There we go. <laughs> well, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, 
Believing the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom God has called to be his own. And Megan, we have Megan's. I want every child here to be able to see what we're doing. And if we have other children sitting back there, because Megan has been baptized. We only have two today. We only have two today, okay. That's, so we want to make sure you're both here. In baptism, as Nira and I have talked, God promises to forgive our sins and to join us together with the family of faith. Know that the promises of God are for you. By baptism, God places his sign upon us. Nira, we have talked a bit about what baptism means. And I warned you, I was going to ask you to explain to the folks here why it is you want to be baptized. And I'll hold my microphone so you can tell them. Go ahead, just talk. No, I'll hold okay. it. Go ahead. I want to show people that God is my Lord. So when, uh, when I die, I'll go to heaven and have everlasting life. Okay, absolutely. And do I hear an amen out there? Amen. amen because they all feel the same way. And this is very important for all of us. Nira, you know that there are some questions I'm gonna ask you, some promises. And so let me ask the first, who is your Lord and Savior? And do you trust in him? Do you want to be a follower of Jesus, to live by his word and follow his love? And folks, you all have a vow to make. Our Lord Jesus commanded us to teach and make disciples of those who are baptized. Do you, the people of Siesta Key Chapel, promise to do what you can to tell Nira, Megan, and our other children the gospel? to model that with your words and actions, to show them how awesome it is to be and do what our God commands and leads us. Do you? Amen. Then join me in prayer, shall you? Almighty God, may the waters that we use this morning truly symbolize the coming of your Holy Spirit deep into Nira's life. May this time be a time where she is drawn closer to you and where you can find habitation. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Up here, Nira. Okay. Nira, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God descend upon you and remain on you always. Amen. Amen. And I have a hanky up there for you. I forgot to bring down. <laughs> but that's okay. What You're going to stay here while our folks actually use words that are really ancient. They were written about 1,500 years ago. And as I say them, they're going to repeat after me. With, actually, I think they're in your bulletin. So we'll say it together. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ's church. We promise to love and encourage you, to share the good news of God's love with you, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Welcome to the fellowship of the church. And whatever you do in word or deed, you do it all to the glory of God as you do so beautifully already. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, as we come to prayer, in addition to the names of those who are in the bulletin, hoping, asking for your prayers throughout the week, I have a few to share with you. First, if you would add Vicki Winkler, who's in round 40 of chemo for pancreatic cancer. Um, also, our administrator, Pat Abdullah, her 26-year-old granddaughter, lives in Michigan and was just diagnosed with stage four cancer. And if you would uh, be in prayer for her and her family as she begins chemo this week. And two of our members will be undergoing surgery tomorrow, Ann Reiner and George Losel. And so if you would again pray for them. I always pray for a good night's sleep, not only for the patient, but for the anesthesiologist. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so let's go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful for your presence, your goodness, your kindness in our lives. And we thank you on this morning especially for the way your grace is revealed through our children. We thank you for the precious life <clears throat> of Nira, Megan, and our other children. We thank you for the gift of family. And in a generation where raising children is filled with so many challenges and temptations, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be especially close to each of our young families, giving the parents wisdom, a sense of humor, patience, and deep, deep love grounded in you. We pray for our congregation as we act the part of God, parents, to the young ones among us. We pray that we would not be apathetic or take for granted the high calling we have to be nurturers and disciple makers. Lord, we ask for you to bless Susie Wills and Deborah, the workers, the volunteers who make chapel kids happen. And we ask that whatever our gifts, that you would motivate each one of us to find ways to be productive channels of grace. We pray for our world. We pray for peace in areas that may be tempted to give up any hope of the cessation of war and violence. We pray for our nation that you would somehow break through the darkness and allow a time where truth and justice, wholeness and reconciliation can lead the way to true peace. We pray for ourselves as individuals, that whatever is going on in our life, that you would keep us from the foolishness of giving in to worry or fear, that instead we would become a people who are marked with prayer, a people who know what it is to look to you in every circumstance, whether it's with rejoicing or with tears. We ask for you to comfort the brokenhearted, to touch those who are looking to you for healing or simply for faith in hard times. We lift up especially to you Heather and Crystal, Anne, Jim, George, Eunice, Ariel, Margot, our bodies are frail, but you are the God who promises to give us what we need as we need it. And so hear us as together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Part of our worship of God is always the bringing 
of our gifts, our tithes and our offerings before him. And I just want to remind you that stopped in your bulletin that I was the announcement ahead of time of the classic one great hour of sharing special offerings which are taken up on Easter. The envelope is there and everything that you need to look at, looking ahead a couple of weeks as we get there. But now let us worship God as we take up our tithes and offerings. We bring our gifts before you, O Lord. We pray that our hearts may, may be there with our gifts, that we know that we are giving, affirming your goodness, your creative love, your redemptive love to us in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Our message from the Old Testament is from the 107th Psalm. Hear the word of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, 
from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and God saved them from their distress. The Lord sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for God's wonderful works to humankind and let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of God's deeds with songs of joy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, George. Well, as we come to our scripture lesson, we're continuing our Lenten series, Living a Transformed Life. Uh, we've talked about what it means to be transformed through grace, through hope. Today, transformed through prayer. And our text is from a letter that deals head on with the whole question of prayer, what it does, how to approach it. The Apostle Paul is writing to believers at what sounds to my ears like his favorite church. He had established it maybe 10 years earlier, uh, had established it at a time when quickly women whom he first preached to at the well, Lydia is named, quickly embraced it. Lydia opened her home, was baptized, her and her household, the church was planted with her at its head. And yet, as the gospel took hold, things became ugly in Philippi. Paul 
along with Silas, his partner, were arrested, beaten, flogged, and forced out of town. You can imagine how that bonded the relationship between him as pastor and the budding congregation. So as he writes them, it's in a letter often referred to as the epistle, the letter of joy. Uh, start to finish, it's all about joy, 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 joy. <laughs> And we are going to hear today and spend a few moments unpacking how you and I can deepen our experience of joy. Listen with me as it comes from Philippians chapter 4, picking it up at the fourth verse. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone, the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard, literally will garrison, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Lucy Jameson woke one morning, about 2.15 in the morning, the same way she had woken about 102 times in her marriage. She woke up in a sweat, a panic. She shook her husband. She said, I hear something. I hear something. There's somebody downstairs. Go see. So Rob, by this point, knew better than to argue. He rolls out of bed. He goes down the stairs. He hits the last step and looks up to the barrel of a gun aimed right at him. <clears throat> Throws his hands in the air, says, don't shoot, don't shoot. I'm going to stand right here, take whatever you want. Silverware's in that drawer. There's money in the cookie jar. Just help yourself. The robber goes around, opens doors, rummages through, shoves everything in a bag. He's about to make his way to the door, turns his back on Rob when Rob shouts, Don't go yet. I have a favor, if you don't mind. Could you just go up the stairs with me, just for a moment? My wife has been looking for you the last 22 years. <laughs> Ever lose sleep because of worry? Anybody here never lose sleep? Oh, you never worry? Okay, I want to talk to you afterwards. <laughs> okay. I dare say most of us find ourselves giving in to the foolish waste of energy known as worry more often than we would like to admit. Even though, even though people who study such things and I've got to tell you, it blows my mind what research money goes into, but there are studies that have been taking place for the last 20 years on what we human beings worry about and whether any of the worries come true. Do you know what they found? I actually did a quick little run through the files from about 1998 to current. Eight to 15% of the things we worry about actually threatened, 8 to 15 percent. An interesting character named E. Joseph Kossman. He died, I think, about 14 years ago. But I remember his name, and I remember his story, because it's so bizarre. He was raised outside of Pittsburgh in a poor family, made a fortune in the days after World War II, he had been a soldier, came home, thought to himself, now, what is it that the people in Europe use that I could sell them? And made a million bucks shipping soap 
overseas to the war-torn area. Smart, right? But then he goes on. He's got this entrepreneurial spirit, and he is the man who decided to manufacture and sell, and he did it exquisitely, shrunken heads, spud guns, which are just what they sound like. You shoot a potato. And ant farms. Remember when we were all children? Does, does Nira have an ant farm? No. When I was her age, I had a series of ant farms because they always died as soon as I opened them. Yes. Well, Joseph Kossman is the man who brought us this and then continued to make a fortune teaching others how to follow their passion. He died with an interesting little legacy behind him, but also these two bits of wisdom. The first, the best way to remember your wife's birthday is to forget it once. <laughs> <clears throat> I could tell stories. <laughs> and the second, if you want to test your memory, try to recall what you were worrying about a year ago today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Worry. It is costly. It is about as productive as sitting in a rocking chair, rocking with all your energy and thinking you're going to arrive at your destination. <laughs> and yet, we all do it. Which prompts me, I, I, I consider myself a student of human nature. I'm always curious by what makes me, what makes us tick. And I've come to the conclusion when it comes to worry, for some of it, it's almost genetic. It's certainly inherited, whether it's a family of origin thing or the way our DNA is mixed. Is your family like mine? In my family, if you really loved someone, you worried. <laughs> and I knew that because every time I left home, when I was 19, when I was 39, when I was 59, Every time I left home, my mom would say, now when you get there, make sure you call me because I'm not going to be able to sleep till I know you're safe. <laughs> and so in my family, my mom did what her mom did, what her mom did, they worried and we knew that they loved us. Which of course is directly linked to the other cause of worry in family lines, magical thinking. You know, I had to go on a plane to California. I was really afraid of the plane. I've heard so many horror stories. I was so worried. I couldn't sleep. I worried. I worried. I got there safe. Thank heavens I worried. <laughs> it worked. The reality is that the Apostle Paul was on to something. One cannot rejoice. One cannot be gentle-natured and given to worry. Most of us here, if you're a regular part of the chapel, you know Chris Cortman, a psychologist in town. He's number one of the therapists that I recommend to folks. Excellent counselor, wonderful Christian gentleman, very wise and yet hysterically funny. I've often told him he missed his calling in stand-up comedy. But I recall one particular series of the School of Christian Living he taught, and he was teaching on worry. To the best of my recollection, this isn't a direct quote, but here's what I remember Chris saying. He said, you can choose to spend your day worrying, but remember, once spent, you can never have it back. It's not as if you can go to God once the future is known and say, oh, Lord, I just wasted two weeks of my life worrying about whether or not the business deal was going to fall apart. A lot of good things have happened in those two weeks. Could I please have that time back again so I can enjoy them? Nah. 
And it's not a new problem, is it? This idea of worry. Some of us give into the magical thinking that it's never been as scary in the world as it is today. It's never been as terrible. Nonsense. All I got to do is look out and say, how many of you survived the Depression? What about World War II? I think we've been through hard times. Paul knew that first century style. And if we had to compare our bad guys and good guys with theirs, we'd win. Paul understood firsthand that the church he loved in Philippi had a constant struggle to rejoice as opposed to worry. As I've mentioned earlier, he was there 10 years earlier when he had been arrested and flogged, beaten, thrown into prison because he was preaching the gospel and because as people embraced the gospel, they no longer fed the economy that was largely dependent on idol worship and manufactured idols. Philippi was a Roman colony, a thriving city. And a good number of those people bought into and were regular worshipers in the cult of the emperor. Everybody knew back then that there were many gods, and if one did not placate your local god, they would get you. And so it was not just a civil obligation or family tradition, it was a matter of being a patriot, that you buy these idols, that you worship at the idols, that you offer sacrifices to the local gods and goddesses as expected. In that context, knowing that Philippi also was the go-to place for retired Roman military. <laughs> In that context, Paul knew that it was dangerous to be a follower of Jesus. There was an economic hit. There was a familial hit. There were dangers, and yet he writes them, Rejoice. Rejoice in everything. Be gentle. And in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. Rejoice. He repeats it twice here. Repeats it all through his letter. Rejoice. Again, I say, rejoice. I learned something new about that word this week. <laughs> I have never before, at least that I can recall, ever looked back to see what the Greek word was and uh, what the options of translation are, I was shocked. That word rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always, the same exact word in the same exact grammatical form is translated in other parts of the New Testament as greetings or farewell. It's aloha, <laughs> first century. I had no idea. But in that word is the same aloha feel that we understand. Be whole, be joyful, embrace the good. And the concept that reading between the lines, what I hear Paul saying is rejoice, fill your mind with everything around you in the moment that is good and noble and lovely and worthy of praise. You know, you, you may be threatened with a lawsuit tomorrow, but man, rejoice in the fact that God is with you and knows the end from the beginning. Rejoice in the fact that you're not alone. Pay attention to the beauty of the trees, the beauty of the birds outside these windows, the nurturing comfort, the smile of the person sitting next to you. Rejoice. Almost as if to say, if you are rejoicing, filled with that joy, there's no room for worry. Rejoice. And he follows it up with a statement, frankly, that sounds unexpected, almost puzzling. We're used to the scriptures and Christian leaders challenging us to be loving and godly and holy, generous, pure. But what does he say here? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'm going to say it. Rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. Isn't that strange? Gentleness. Why would that be? Of all the virtues, why gentle? Could it be that gentleness is the mark of a person who does not worry habitually? I say that because I think back to the times when I am giving in to worry and I'm a monster. <laughs> I become irritable, I become short, I become ungrateful. When I'm gentle, when I'm lenient, when I'm patient, I'm not worrying. I'm in a good place. And so I give Paul credit for utter brilliance <laughs> in saying, let your gentleness be known to all. And it's almost as if he follows it up, say, let your gentleness be known to all, and you can do it. Why? Because the Lord is near. The Lord is right beside you. So why would you not be patient? Why would you not be kind? Why would you not be lenient and gentle? And of course, at this point, all of us kind of take a sigh and say, oh, this sounds so good. Rejoice in everything. Be gentle. But how do we do that? This is where Paul, the lawyer, kicks in. Because he tells us how. He goes on to say, Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In everything. Important, important, underline, circle the word in, not for everything. I have heard so much bad theology wrapped around it's God's purpose for you to have stubbed your toe. Be grateful you broke your arm. That's not what I hear. I hear something bad has happened, but even then, take it to God in prayer. Instead of worrying, twist it, tweak it, transform it to prayer. And what is supplication? That's a big word. If the kids were here, I'd have to go into a definition. Supplication is just prayer with passion. It's pleading. And so Paul is saying, when the temptation to worry, when the temptation to fear comes, recognize it, call it out for what it is, and in that moment, transform it to prayer and passionate, pleading, intense prayer with thanksgiving. And that's the difference. Because when we pray with thanksgiving, even if the worst has arrived, we force ourselves, we discipline ourselves to say, and yet, God, I am so grateful you are listening. I am so grateful you are here. I am so grateful this is not the end of the story. With thanksgiving. I'd like to close with one piece of practical advice. It's something new. Hadn't heard this particular approach to developing a better prayer life. If you're like me, my problem is I will pray, I will pray passionately, and then I'll kind of, thanks God, I'll take it from here. <laughs> but in this, in a book called Still Married, Still Sober, <laughs> David McKenzie offered this tip. He said, to act out the principle of turning prayers over to God, my wife and I took a paper bag, wrote God on it, and taped it up high, so it's got to be up high, out of reach, on the kitchen door. As I prayed about matters such as my career, my role as a father, my abilities to be a good husband, 
I would write down each concern on a piece of paper. Then those pieces of paper would go in the bag. The rule was that if you start worrying about a matter of prayer you've already turned to God, you have to climb up on a chair and fish it out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that works for me. I'm going to try this. Why? Because our capacity to enjoy God, our capacity capacity to be a source of blessing to others is directly related to our capacity for joy, for rejoicing, for gentleness, and for prayer. Yes? Yes. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, you know we need your help. You know we want to be a people of faith, for whom worry and fear have no effect. That's what we want. But we need your help to grow and to make progress. And so wherever each one of us might be in our own walk with you, in our relationship with other people, give us faith and give us a desire to draw closer to you that we might indeed be a people marked by prayer and gentleness and rejoicing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I hope to see you all back here at 4 o'clock today for the concert. But now let us go out in the world bold and unafraid, knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit are with us now and will remain always. Amen.